Hello folks, today we're going to take a look at some pure collector's unobtainium. This watch is rare, in fact it's so rare that if you search Google for Buren Inkastar you'll find pictures of it from one watch, mine. I own the only one I can find. Now if we look inside this watch you'll see it's absolutely gorgeous. What makes this so rare is the Inca Star here. Not to be confused with the Inca Block, the Inca Star was a way of regulating a mechanical watch with a free floating balance spring. Now, we're going to get into this during the time where we tear down and reassemble this thing, which we'll be doing, because unfortunately this is a non runner. And I begin to see why here. Already we have a completely broken set lever screw. Uh, managed to get it out a little bit. I'll have to tweak that out as we go through. Now, if this movement ring was installed by Buren, I'll eat my socks. There is no chance that this is an original Buren part. It's the wrong size, which is why it springs into action there and near gives me a heart attack. Now, I'd love to tell you that the case and handset for this watch are original to it, but I can't. I've never seen another one. I can't find a picture of another one. Um, I can't find one that's been sold or a record of the sale except for the one I purchased. So knowing if this is completely original or not is a very difficult task. Now, my guess would be that the handset here and the movement are original along with the dial. They all went together would be my guess from the factory. As to the case and movement ring, I'm going to give a big thumbs down to the movement ring because there is no way Buren did that. And as to the case, genuinely, I have no idea. It could be a Frankenwatch case or it could be the original Buren case. I have my doubts that it's the original case. A watch like this would have normally gone into a solid gold case uh, and this one wasn't. So my belief would be that at some point in its history, this watch has had its case stripped off to be sold as scrap gold. And then some enterprising person has come along and stuck it in another case. I don't really mind in this instance because this thing is so rare it's not like you've got a choice of what you want to buy this is probably the rarest watch that i've ever handled now it's absolutely gorgeous on the inside didn't have too many problems getting the hands out i'm going to relieve the pressure off the mainspring now the stress off the mainspring and you can see here one of the reasons why it might not have been working. I think we found the other half of our set lever screw. And that is, I can assure you, even though I am not Breguet here, that is not where it's supposed to be. So I'm going to get the top of the barrel bridge disassembled here. Fairly standard stuff so far. And I'd like to talk a little bit about why the thumbnail looks the way it does for a start. And also a little bit about Buren and Buren's history. Now I'll try and cover any pertinent points during the disassembly. But if you're a real watch nerdy kind of guy and you're only interested in the actual nuts and bolts, not so much the history of the company or why the thumbnail is the way it is, then I'll be discussing all of that during the reassembly. And I've chapter marked the whole video for people that want to skip around a bit. Also, during the course of this video, I'll be making a strap for this watch, a very unusual strap, one of the nicest I've made to fit a very unusual deployant. So if that's what you're here for, feel free to just skip ahead to the strap making portion. So why do I have a picture of Van Gogh on my thumbnail and why would I call this watch priceless? Well, priceless in the fact that I cannot find a price for it because there's no record that I can personally find of one being sold. Now, if you're a regular viewer on my channel, you know I don't do investment watches. I don't collect for money. Uh, it's not something I discuss. I buy what I like regardless of the price. Now, that price is normally determined by what Mrs. Saving Time will put up with. But genuinely speaking, I don't collect watches as a way of making money and I don't advise people which watches they should buy and what will increase in value. Now, I consider from a collection standpoint, this watch to be priceless because it simply cannot be replaced, at least not easily or quickly. And I've never seen a price established for this. Now, I've seen 
Bjorn's sell for thousands of dollars, depending on the movement, the condition, and etc. But a price for this one is quite difficult to determine, because as I say, I bought the only one I've ever seen for sale, and I bought it for a pittance from a Czech auction site that does not specialize in watches, and I bought it from somebody who obviously didn't know what it was. Now, before you all start grabbing a keyboard and typing shame in the comments, I also didn't know what it was until I bought it. I've collected Bjorn for quite some time, and I didn't know they made an Inca Star. Um, I don't know anyone who did know they made an Inca Star. I didn't really look at the listing that closely. I just saw an old Bjorn with a nice dial. I paid a very small amount of money for it, and uh, it turned up. And it wasn't until I opened it that... I realized that this was something a little different, some experimentation from Buren, I am sure, in this watch. And I'm convinced that there can never have been more than a handful of these produced. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is every time I do one of these videos, I'll get a bunch of people ask me what the watch is worth, as in a dollar amount. Now, I'm going to paraphrase Oscar Wilde here and say at some point we'll all understand the price of everything but the value of nothing. What's the dollar amount on this watch? Well, I couldn't tell you. It did remind me a little bit of the guy that had Van Gogh sunflowers hanging in his toilet that he bought for 20 bucks and later sold for $70 million. What it's worth is what people are prepared to pay for it, of course. So if you get a Buren Hamilton collectors together in a room and they're rich and they really want it, it might be worth a considerable amount of money. On the other hand, if you just bung it on eBay, it might go for a quite a bit of money. It might go for a hundred bucks. It's very difficult to say. As a collector, what I can say is I'm extremely pleased to have found this. I have a Buren micro rotor, uh, various other examples of Buren. I'm not going to find another one of these, I'm pretty sure, and I'm pretty sure everybody watching is not going to be able to find one either, which I apologize for, because normally I like to bring you watches that you can go and grab yourself and follow along with me. This is not going to be one of those instances. Even the base caliber Buren 370, which is the basis for this Buren Inca Star, is a fairly expensive watch. Now the back side of the watch has been completely disassembled. It was an absolute delight to work on. I'm going to flip over to the dial side and disassemble the keyless and motion works. Now this is, I'm going to say it again, an absolutely delightful watch to work on. It's put together in a way that to me makes perfect sense. The finishing for being from the 1950s, late 40s, 50s, maybe somewhere around there, again, difficult to get exact information on this precise watch, is great. It suffered very little in the way of wear and tear, or we'll be looking in a microscope in a while, so you'll see some keyless works comes apart, no problem. Um, everything on this watch comes apart, no problem. One of the nicest, again, I've worked on. And you'll see in this video, I've left quite a few lingering shots of the movement of this thing, because the dial side of a watch, the side we're working on now, can often look like absolute trash. Uh, even on very good watches, it's always going to be covered by the dial. Like They don't seem to put a lot of effort into it. Buren seem to have gone an extra mile here. Even the dial side looks nice i am thoroughly impressed with this and i'm enjoying my time taking it apart now the inca block setting here will need to be uh, removed the same with the top of the balance inca block setting to take the jewel and it's shut on out so they can be cleaned independently now this whole thing of course will be cleaned in an ultrasonic cleaner but these jewels I clean independently for a couple of reasons. It's just easier. They often have caked on oil and they need to be scrubbed. And also I'm going to put the balance assembly back in for the cleaning process. And if those jewels are in place, the pivots of the balance assembly won't get cleaned. The other thing that needs to be done is this hairy, absolutely revolting spring um, here it needs to be taken out the barrel lid there a lot of hair on that not sure where it came from and another thing with this watch is this spring is kaput 
you see the way it's not springing out of the barrel it's got no power left at all in it i don't know whether it's been just sat for an extremely long time or did have a little bit of power as it tried to escape there as always but yeah this powers this is not going to power our watch very well uh, another spring will have to be obtained barrel arbor comes out and that spring is just going to be discarded uh, it's no use to anyone However, the mainspring in a watch is considered a consumable, so I don't really mind having to replace that. Now, the balance assembly is going back in here for cleaning. And again, I'm going to have to flip up that top ink block. Now, when this has been taken out, this whole watch and all of its parts are going to go into my ultrasonic cleaner. I'm going to have to give the case a clean. Also, I'm going to give the case a helping hand by getting rid of more some of the more stubborn dirt. It's often necessary, especially when cases haven't been cleaned for a long time. Now, I would genuinely recommend Buren if you are a vintage watch guy and you haven't come across them. Um, they were bought by Hamilton in 1966, I think. Uh, when Hamilton moved to Switzerland, they bought Buren to move their operations from the US over to Switzerland. Now, there was a good reason for this. Buren are an excellent, excellent manufacturer. I think they rival some of the best brands out there, but because they're a little known, you can pick them up for a relatively inexpensive price. So here you can see all of the parts of my cleaning regime, just the cleaning basket, the top of my ultrasonic cleaner and the beaker I use to fit the cleaning basket in. Now this watch is going to need a strap and a watch like this I didn't want to put it on just a piece of leather. So this is actually snake skin. It's too thin to use by itself, but you'll see me bond this to a piece of vegetable tanned leather in a second. And I'm just going to say for all of you guys in the comments that tell me every single time that every single dress looking watch should go on black, I disagree and I will fight you about that. There is another reason why this is going on blue, and it's historically Buren did supply a lot of their higher end watches on blue straps, although not blue snakeskin. Blue in itself was a bit of a novelty back in the day, just for straps for watches. One of the reasons being that nowadays, of course, you might own several watches. You might have a watch, sports watch, a daily driver, a dress watch for going out. You know, you might have a whole bunch of watches. Uh, back in the day, these things were very expensive. So this is why, if you've noticed, most watches from the 40s, 50s and 60s, maybe 60s started to change a little bit, will look like dress watches. And that's because your watch had to suit for all occasions. And you actually needed it not just as a piece of jewellery, you needed it to tell the time. And if you can only buy one watch, a dress watch is not a bad one to go for because, you know, it can suit both dress and casual, where a sports watch business meeting might have been a little difficult, especially in the 1950s. So we've got our snake here bonded to a piece of uh, very nice vegetable tanned leather. This is untreated vegetable tanned leather. So I will be oiling it and waxing it up after I finish putting the strap together. Now, you can see that both sides of our strap that I cut here look to be the same length. And again, I am sure that there will be some of you shouting in the comments that one side of a strap should be shorter than the other. I am aware, but this strap will be going on a deployant clasp that requires a rather unusual configuration. It also requires the strap here to be no thicker than about 1.5, 1.6 millimeters. So it's not a difficult strap to make, but it does have some caveats to it. It's for a Cartier Type 1 deployant, if you were wondering, and that's what I'll be wearing. Now, some of you always ask me as my watch flashes past in these pictures what I'm wearing. What I'm wearing at the moment is my own watch, which I created in a video, which I'll link up here. So I'm getting both sides of this strap cut. Again, they're the same size just because of the unusual clasp they'll be fitting into. And in fact, you'll see me make this strap and both sides will look identical. This is the way type one Cartier straps work or straps for type one Cartier deployants. Straps for type two, 
Cartier deployments look different again. So if you are trying to buy a strap for a Cartier deployment, make sure you know which deployment you have and get a strap maker that knows something about Cartier deployments, or you're going to get a strap that just isn't going to fit. They are, as I say, not that difficult to make. They are, however, a pain to get to fit right. And I believe back in the day, if you bought a watch from Cartier with one of their deployments, they would custom make the strap for you. They only do this for preferred customers now, which has left a lot of people out in the cold. If they own an old vintage Cartier and they want a strap for it, I don't particularly like that. Um, I don't particularly like this concept of preferred customers and whatnot. If you sell me something and I come back years later, I expect you to put it right. But that's just me. So I'm cutting the round over here for the ends of our strap and both straps will be cut exactly the same. Now, normally I'd prefer to do that with a template off, but in this case, it's very difficult to mark snakeskin. It's very, very delicate. Now, before I proceed any further, I just want to check this is an 18 millimeter strap. I'm at 18.2, which is kind of perfect because it's going to have to be sanded down. Now, here is the aforementioned Cartier deployant type one uh, with the strap folded at both ends, unlike the type two, and it has to be thin enough to go through there. Now, this is not an original Cartier. This one came from Cousins. They do a non OEM version. Uh, which they sell on their website. There are some dodgy Chinese ones about. I can't attest to the quality of those, but the ones from Cousins, they're okay. Uh, I quite like them. Now, I'm going to punch holes in this strap, which normally I prefer to do by hand. I normally prefer to do everything by hand. I cut the rounds by hand. I punch the holes by hand. Everything is by hand. Now, I do own machines to do this too. Uh, I just stop using them. So I own sewing machines and punches and or punches and things like this. I just... I find that I prefer to craft by hand. I make things for people by hand. It's what the people I work for, the clients I have, it's what they want. And it's the way I prefer to do it. Now, obviously that does make everything a lot more expensive. And the reason I'm using the punch here is just because of the delicacy of this skin. I don't want to have to hit it too much with a hammer like this. Now, this is a three millimeter diamond punch. So very small stitches for anyone wondering. I'd normally use a a French punch for this. Um, I'm using a diamond punch here. I can't find my three millimeter. Um, in all honesty, I can't find my three millimeter French punch. It will be somewhere. I'd recommend diamond punches if you want to give leather work a go. Um, the string I use, again, because of people have asked, I use a Wexin handmade uh, polyester thread if I'm using polyester. And I use a super fine linen. These are expensive threads. However, I would very much recommend them. Um, the normal threads that you can buy, they're around a couple of dollars, a couple of bucks, in my opinion, don't wear well. They don't hold up well. The Wexin thread is around, I'm going to say about $10, $11 a spool. And the linen I use is around $20 a spool. So expensive, but worth the money. This is saving time sewing our strap together here because one of you guys told us she was talented in one of the videos and now she insists on being in every video, which is fine by me because although I do sew, um, it's not something I particularly enjoy. Now I'm going to secure the ends of this with uh, Sinoacrylate super glue. Um, I've done this for years. I sometimes come out the side of the strap, which I think I've demonstrated and I've never had an issue. Now here we have video evidence of me putting the needles back in the pot. So when I get asked later, I can simply show the video. Now the strap will have to be finished. Now edge finishing on straps, Again, all of this is because people ask me, edge finishing on straps makes a strap expensive, um, especially if it's done by hand. It will take me longer to finish the edges on this strap and put the details in than it does to make the strap. So if you're wondering why there's a discrepancy in the price of leather straps you might find online, why some makers straps are $70 and some are $150. Look at the edges. If the edges are beautifully painted and finished, um, it's probably that. Now, obviously, for some people, that's not worth paying the freight on. You know, that's not something that you're going to want to pay for, but that's the, a reason for sometimes discrepancy in price. So the stitching's been done. 
both of these straps together and now the edge work needs to be done now i've already done a little bit of sanding on this and a test of the edge color so here i come in and i'm going to use a roller the other way to do it is just with an owl basically a needle the french way both ways work fine um what i think i would would advise is when you put an edge paint on don't put it on too thick the the way to do it is to put it on wait for it to dry use a hair dryer or if you have one a uh, back of an edging tool to dry the paint sand it paint it sand it paint it now as i said it takes me longer to finish the edges than it does to make the rest of the strap and i've made a slight well mistake here normally i would crease the strap before I edge paint so I'm going to crease this strap now and then I'll show you the final edge painted now I've cut in uh, holes for quick release spring bars so I can get this one on and off nice and easy I've waxed the back of the strap with my own mixture of beeswax so that's very nice and supple and soft now there is the thing I use to cut quick release spring bars by the way before somebody asked me and our strap here in my opinion is looking absolutely gorgeous i'll show you the edges in a second they should look pretty spot on i didn't spend a huge amount of time with this one but i did spend enough time to make it really really nice watch deserves no less in this case so i should show you the edging in a minute when i get round to it obviously i'm voicing this over after the fact so I must have been very impressed with what this looked like and that snakeskin does have a lovely metallic sheen to it that's untreated by the way in sunlight this thing looks almost like a metal bracelet it's really really nice the video is not doing this justice at all although I still think it looks quite nice here too there's my edges as you can see they're fairly spot on you don't want to see layers of leather or marks or roughness on those edges at all you just want a beautiful perfect edge in this case i went with the dark navy blue to offset the lighter blue of the strap now i think this one's going to suit the watch perfectly but please do feel free to tell me in the comments that i should have made a black one because i'm sure some of you are going to so now we've done with our strap, it doesn't need holes or anything for the deployant. I want to take a look at our watch movements come back from the cleaners under a microscope. Now I'm just checking the jewels here to make sure there's no cracks or chipping or damage. And normally I would examine everything that comes out the cleaner under the scope just to make sure there's no extra dirt and stuff on it. Now you can see with the age of this one what you're looking at here is not actually dirt it's the plating wearing away so this would be nickel plated brass and that plating is started to wear this is a very very old watch so this is not uncommon to see this type of sort of little micro pitting our jewels are looking very nice but you can definitely see wear on the plate this is going to be a common feature on a lot of vintage watches with this one you can see some tool marks on it as well where it hasn't been perfectly finished i would still consider this a high level of finish if you're not used to looking at watches under a microscope this might seem rough to you in actuality it's perfectly smooth we are just at extremely high magnification to the naked eye it looks almost perfect there you can see some tool marks along where our click spring would go that haven't been cleaned up now i need to get a new spring wound in for this and i use these antique vintage winders i recommend these find them on ebay about 120 dollars a set um great value for money i own some of the chinese ones the ones with steel arbors they're okay i never use them because of this set so to get the spring in and this is a vintage spring i didn't have time to wait for a new one to turn up just for the constraints of youtube sometimes you've got to speed things up a get a bit for the platform so this spring isn't going to be perfect i'm not expecting huge amounts of amplitude out of it and i will be replacing it once the new one arrives but just for the sake of making this video so we can all enjoy this beautiful watch together i'm going to use this one i just had lying around it's the correct size just a little bit underpowered so that goes into the vintage winder and then of course we'll need to oil that we'll need to oil the barrel and we'll need to start getting this watch back together 
So while I'm doing that in the background, I just want to cover briefly the history of Buren and why I like them, or one of the many reasons why I like them. They make fantastic watches. I've never seen a bad Buren. They're also responsible for the creation of the first micro rotor. A lot of people will tell you it was Universal Genève, but Buren beat them to market. So who came up with the idea first? Couldn't tell you. I could tell you Buren brought to market first. I can also tell you that the Buren Caliber 1000, 1001 is probably the cheapest way to put a vintage micro rotor on your wrist and is also the basis of the world's first automatic chronograph. So just an interesting company in general. A lot of achievements to their name. Now, the company itself was founded in 1898 when a British guy, an English guy, H. Williamson, his company being H. Williamson Limited, purchased a Swiss company called Fritz Suter and Company in the Swiss town of Buren. It wasn't until 1916 that Henry Williamson, the owner of the English owner of Buren, so technically I guess it's an English company, used the signature Buren Watch Company. Unfortunately, Buren, uh, or at least Henry Williamson, the then owner of Buren, suffered some financial setback setbacks during a stock market crash, and the company was sold to a group of Swiss and uh, English businessmen as an investment opportunity. Now, I believe one of those businessmen businessmen was Swiss American, dual nationality. So in 1966, the company was sold to Hamilton, which is where Hamilton got their thin omatic micro rotor line from. And it helped Hamilton move manufacturing from the US to Switzerland, presumably for cost saving reasons for tax saving reasons. I mean, nowadays it seems ludicrous to move manufacturing from the US to Switzerland to be cheaper, but back in the day, this was a thing. So Hamilton did that. Um, the watch market, as probably everybody knows, started to really fall apart. Hamilton later sold Buren to another company, Dugena, I believe, a German manufacturer. And Hamilton themselves were taken over by SSIH, which later became the Swatch Group in 1971. Okay, so that's basically the history of Buren. Um, all of its, it was gone by 1972. It had been completely folded into this watch group. Now, going back to our Buren, the bridges and everything here are going on a treat. If you want a detailed description of exactly what's going where, uh, you can see it in a lot of my other videos. Um, but for this one, I really had, don't have a lot to comment about because this thing is so easy to take apart and put back together. Um, I haven't worked on anything that was this simple since my Zenith, um, which was also a 1950s or late. Actually, that one was early 1940s with a movement made by Blancpain. I'll link that video up there. It's an older video. It's still good, though. So our click spring going in now. Now, I did have one uh, mistake here. I didn't actually realize that the in this particular movement design, it would be much better to put the click in before the click spring. So here's the moment where I kind of realized that. And I'll just flip to the part where I remove the spring, put the click in. There you go. And then put the spring back in. Now, a little bit of oil around our barrel here. Um, barrel arbor. Now I'm going to say I'm not going to show every single tiny oiling step because we'd be here for a month at Sundays. But that Buren ratchet wheel there looking absolutely superb. It's got that nice lovely bluing in the engraving. As I say, I, I normally go in these videos uh, over a lot of the um, a lot of the difficulties you have with vintage watches. But honestly, I experienced very few difficulties. Not sure about that drop of oil there, by the way. I just noticed a lot of wear around that area of the plating, so I figured it probably couldn't hurt to put a little drop of oil on the outside there. Our crown wheel being rebuilt with all of its components here. Now, this screw will probably be reverse threaded. You'll normally notice on the top of a screw in a watch if it's reverse threaded, it'll have a couple of cuts like that, either side of the main slot for the screwdriver. Not always, so, uh, so look out. But if you see that, 
99 times out of 100, that means it's going to be reverse threaded. Now, right here, we're going to completely pretend I did not forget one of the screws on the train of wheels bridge. And I'm just going to slip that in there without anyone noticing. And you'll notice our train of wheels there. Unusual design, absolutely fantastically pretty, in my opinion, allows more of the movement to be exposed, which looks great. And now the top side of the watch is rebuilt. I'm going to have to flip that over and put the set lever uh, in there. You won't see that on camera. I'm also going to have to add a little bit of oil to this jaw here because the minute wheel is going to come in and cover it up. So as I said, there's going to be a few steps on the oiling missing here. Notably, I don't think I show the oiling of the... Um, stem the cannon pinion is going on there and i don't think i show the oiling of the minute wheel it's just for times of constraint and also editing as you can imagine with the number of cameras i use and everything else editing these videos becomes quite painful a um, little bit of grease not oil here for the uh, intermediate winding wheel and before people grab on the keyboard uh, yep that's upside down um i do spot it and I, I will flip it back around the right way in a minute but uh you could hold your comments on that one i also noticed during the assembly luckily enough not during the edit which happens to me sometimes so sliding and winding pinion getting a little bit of grease and going in um it's the worst thing in the world by the way when i'm editing one of these videos and i notice a mistake because obviously it's nice for me to be able to go back and fix it it's nice that i know it's there but after you've already got everything back together to notice a mistake is a little heartbreaking but watchmaking is hard doing this is is not an easy task learning all the things if you're thinking about having a go yourself i recommend it just go for it um the, it's just a watch people get very serious about this sort of thing but it is at the end of the day just a watch if you buy a couple of mass-produced watches i mean even amiga mass-produced watches back in the day so as long as you're not destroying a piece unique or a museum piece for me it doesn't matter give it a go learn what you learn if you break something relax it's just a watch so here you can see i am taking off the intermediate winding wheel and flipping it back up the right way told you i spotted it our yoke has gone in our yoke spring needs to go in i used to have big problems with these i've gotten better at it um, it takes a little bit of practice but they will still ping off to join the swiss pro space program i can assure you that that will happen to you i've seen watchmakers with 20 30 years of experience crawling on the floor looking for those little buggers so the cover plate i like to put this on asap just to stop that spring ejecting itself because those things do not i don't know they just don't exist in the same time and space that the rest of us do they do not obey the laws of physics i am absolutely convinced that they do not so i like to get my cover plate on asap a little bit more grease for anywhere you would have metal on metal contact on the setting jumper there and you can see our keyless works flipping the watch backwards and forwards between setting and winding mode now, I know you can't feel it, but it's smooth as silk, as you would expect from a movement of this caliber. And there is one of the capsules going into Bergeon B-Dip, which I'm going to agitate with a blower. Just a little ultrasonic action almost, I guess. Just helps clean it, but you can still see a spot of dried oil on that jaw. So it's off to a bit of rubber, a bit of rubber, a bit of leather on a stick where I'm going to polish off that dried oil. And you want your jewels to have a mirror shine. And I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere. It just escapes me at the moment. But yeah, shine up your jewels, gentlemen. So there we go. Lovely and shiny. A bit difficult to catch on camera, but I do my best. And then you want to oil that. You want about half of the jewel covered in oil a little bit less and you want to make sure that's in the center so we're on a magnify one a microscope here of course and i'm also going to do the same with the cap jewel on the balance by the way i'm not going to show it because it's exactly the same procedure as the cap jewel for the bottom of the balance as it is for the top of the balance so when you see me introduce the balance on here i'll have already done that I'm just going to save us all a bit of time and trouble by not having to edit it and show it to you on the camera. Now, back over on the other side of the watch, we, of course, need to put our pallet fork in. Now, the exit pallet has also been oiled or will be oiled. The camera on my um, triocular microscope is kaput 
for some reason so i'm not going to be able to show you it this time it's just a drop of oil on the exit palette however now pallet fork and pallet bridge both get screwed down making sure that that pallet fork pivot is coming through i can now wind a little bit of power into this watch now i'm not going to wind it all the way i'm going to give it about a three quarter or make that a quarter wind a bit of a difference there but yeah so when that's done i should be able to snap this pallet fork backwards and forwards uh it should snap cleanly across if you have to drag it across you've got something a bit wrong somewhere balance going back in this one was quite tricky to fit not the most difficult i've had but it's a large balance wheel so you just got to be careful you don't want to tangle your spring in there i got to be careful to look to make sure my bottom pivot is engaged uh, these are all things I'm really careful with. I am not uh, a professional watchmaker by any stretch. So a little burst of air kicks that right up into life. Now, normally I'd like to see that kick up as soon as I put it down. But if a little burst of air does it, I'm going to stick it on the time grapher to give it a test. Now, first, I need to oil some of the jewels on the top and also the bottom plate. I'll show the top ones as not to just repeat everything. Now, this one I oiled before I turned the camera on. Genius. This one I'm going to oil slightly out of focus because, again, genius. And hopefully the third one on the train at wheels bridge, I'll actually oil in focus and on camera. There we go. Third time's the charm. So you don't want too much oil. At least I try not to get too much oil. One of the most difficult things about watchmaking for me is the oil. I think it is for everyone. Uh, it's kind of tricky to not get too much and, and too much is mostly worse than none at all. So a little bit of oil here for our center wheel. Now, this is where the two extra jewels on this watch come from, by the way. Normally, this would be a 15 jewel watch. Buren also put jewels here. It's a little higher quality watch movement than normal. So time graph uh, results are fantastic for being at a quarter wind. The B error can be adjusted right from the balance on this watch. It's no problem. You just turn it and it's under a millisecond. Anyhow, the rate is fantastic. At full wind, this thing settled into about plus four seconds a day with an amplitude of around 283. So it's absolutely spot on. I can see why this regulation system was used in a lot of chronometers. I'm surprised this watch isn't classified as a chronometer, probably because Buren built so few of them that they really didn't want to go to the trouble of getting chronometer certification for it. Now, the crystal I have, again, no idea if that's original, but I'm going to clean it up. I use one of these rubber uh, end tips for my uh, Dremel Proxon um, to clean crystals. I also do a lot of the work by hand. Uh, there's the tip. You can buy them from jewelers shops. They're specifically designed to polish acrylic. They come in a couple of different grades, rough and smooth. I uh, would recommend them. Save you a bit of time. So dial going back on this absolute masterpiece of a dial in my previous video i actually made my own dial from scratch so i have a bit more understanding of just how difficult something like this is to pull off and get it to look this nice because mine i really liked it it's not this good <laughs> i'm just gonna put that out there mine was not this good but i don't mind losing to buren i really really don't so i'm going to push the hands on um, and I'll always come in after I push the hands on with a bit of Radico just to make sure I've got no dust or schmutz. Now, you'll notice I didn't clean this dial. You would have to be barking mad, in my opinion, to clean this dial. Uh, it's perfect the way it is. But I also didn't polish the hands. You can see there, there's a little roughness to them. And that's because if I polish the hands, I would then need to polish all the numerals around the dial. And it would be a 70 year old watch that looked almost brand new, which to me looks a little bit strange. Also then I would have had to have cleaned and re-polished the case. And I'm gonna be honest, I like this one so much that I'll probably acquire a solid gold case for it and bung it in that. Um, because I think this thing would look magnificent in a solid gold or maybe white gold, although it wasn't much of a vintage thing case and uh, I'm not springing for platinum. So probably this will go on a gold case at some point as I don't believe that case to be original. 
Now, I went to this movement ring and I went to put it in and that's when I remembered that it was the work of an absolute muppet. So I actually end up uh, taking this out and filing it down so it fits in nicely, which I think I'll fit to. So I just took this, spun it and filed it so it was round instead of whatever shape the bloke that fitted it was trying to make, but definitely wasn't round. Now it's round. And you can see here, I watch this back in the case. Now it was pressed back together in a watch press, which again, you can see on a lot of my other videos, we use one of those. I use a 3D printed parts to get that crystal pressed in and then a standard watch press um, just to get the back pushed on. I don't show it here again, just for reasons of time, but I'll watch this back together. It's keeping excellent time. I've had it on wrist for a few weeks now. It keeps perfect time. It is magnificent. This is one of the jewels of my collection thus far. I love this watch. Um, it's on a Cartier Type 1 deployant. The strap with it to my eye looks absolutely superb. I couldn't have been happier with this one. Dial, superb. Movement, superb. Hands, great. Case, eh, you can't have everything. But I do like the look of the case. Those vintage kind of sweat lugs really suit it. So I hope you enjoyed this one. I want to thank you if you stuck with me so far. Normally a lot of the audience drops off towards the end of the video. So if you're still with me, give me a like, a subscribe if you liked it. Do all that YouTube stuff. It was really nice talking to you all again. And I'll be back with a new video shortly. Thank you all very much for watching.